Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have everyone join us. Our presenter is going to be Eric Wilkstrom, Training Manager from RTI Group. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, RTI Group. RTI provides complete quality assurance solutions for all x-ray modalities and facilities. Click and go solutions for your x-ray QA. For more information, do visit rtigroup.com. A couple of reminders before we get started with our presentation. The next MD Expo is coming up October 11 through 13 in SoCal, Temecula, California. Registration for the MD Expo SoCal is now open online. This conference strives to provide biomedical and HTM professionals with a unique, intimate, and rewarding conference second to none. Join us for three days at the Pachanga Resort and Casino in Temecula, California. The URL for more information or to go ahead and register for the conference is mdexposhow.com. As always, we're going to wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A. You're welcome to submit your questions at any time during today's presentation. You can use the question feature on your webinar dashboard. Uh, we'll reserve the questions and get through as many as possible in our 60-minute allotted time frame. Today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. To obtain the CE certificate, you'll need to complete the post-webinar survey. That survey will be emailed to you in one hour after the completion of the webinar. You must complete the survey to receive the CE certificate and you'll be able to download your certificate and print from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions or challenges along the way, please reach out to the team here at webinar at mdpublishing.com. All right, let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. I'm excited that we're joined by Eric Wolstrom of RTI Group. Uh, we're going to join Eric as he provides insights into certain measurement situations where there may be a need for alternative setups in order to achieve reproducible and practical results as well as an efficient procedure. So Eric, you may begin whenever you're ready. All right. So thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you also to MD Publishing for giving us this opportunity to share some of our experiences from, from the field. Um, before we get into the topic of today, I'd just like to uh, give you a pretty brief introduction and a background of RTI Group, where we're coming from. Uh, RTI Group is a Swedish company. We're based out of Gothenburg uh, in, on the Swedish West Coast. Uh, we started uh, 40 years ago uh, in that town as a result of a thesis project at the Technical University. Uh, that was the first um, non-invasive KB meter, by the way, in 1981. Since then, we've uh, expanded and have our own office in uh, New Jersey, in Tuwaco, where we also have a calibration lab and where our uh, uh, North American office is. And recently, we opened up an office in Singapore, uh, which is a sales office for us there to co cover the APAC uh, region. The global customers are quite uh, a few. We have quite a lot of long standing relationships with uh, the large manufacturers, GE being one of the oldest and most uh, um, historical um, partners that we have. Uh, in the field, um, but of course we also work with, with other, the, all of the other large manufacturers uh, of X-ray, diagnostic X-ray uh, machines. So looking back a little bit at the history, uh, it started like we said in 1981 uh, with the world's first non-invasive KB meter. Uh, it was in 1981 and here you can see the uh, what do you call it, the detector, which is right here, of the DGX, which was the name of the first non-invasive KV meter. Uh, moving on to the 90s, we've got some uh, other uh, designs of the products. They are more compact and also measure dose, HVL and total filtration, uh, and as the functionality is expanded. In the 2000s, uh, we move into a multi-probe 
uh, configuration with the Barracuda, uh, which could have multiple multiple probes connected to it, and also a Bluetooth link to a display unit. Um, that was also followed by the Piranha, which is a compacted version of the Barracuda, uh, also possible, uh, also able to work with external probes. What we have today is a product range uh, that looks like this. We've still got the Piranha family, where it's been upgraded and updated as we move along. We've got five main uh, versions of it, with uh, ranging from uh, multi-modality, and uh, that includes everything: CT, MAMO, R, RF, fluoro, vascular, and dental, and down to the single modality units. Uh, for instance, the Piranha Dental. We have a low range family as well, Cobia, which is single modality or only. Uh, and they all then are united by a software for display functionality and also for analyses purposes of the data. The software there is called Ocean. Um, then, of course, we've got some probes that uh, connect to the instruments so that we can have. Uh, data that are applicable and relevant to the tests that need to be performed in the field. Uh, when we talk about customer priorities, in the 40 years we've been active, we've learned that uh, fast calibration service is uh, a must, it's very valuable. Uh, we've, we're working towards uh, the limit of 10 days of the turnaround uh, for a calibration service. Uh, we're, we're at 12 days at the moment, not, we're not quite happy with that. We want to get it back down to 10 days uh, of, uh, of 10 working days to get the calibration done. Um, the calibration cycle that we recommend is uh, every two years. Um, if there are requirements for one year and calibration cycle, that's fine. We handle that as well, of course. Uh, um, but our recommendation is once every two years. Uh, if that calibration cycle is uh, maintained, there is a possibility to extend the warranty up to 10 years. And then, it, then we think it's, it's time to, to let that go. And we've got a service or we've got a support team, um, both on, on the telephone and also on a web portal where you can have a, a, utilize the, the frequently, frequently asked questions and also uh, a guided um, solutions uh, for, for the most common support issues that's uh, on the web. Uh, access to these and how that's done, you can find that on our website, uh, which is rtigroup.com. All right, so for the topic today, I thought we'd start with, uh, we're going to look at three different parts and three different examples where we can find a more, uh, maybe a more efficient way to gather uh, measurement data in, in the field for relevant data. The first one we'll look at is dental CBCT, which is a bit of a um, in limbo in some areas when it comes to what measurements need to be performed. Dental CBCT, of course, is uh, looks a little bit like panoramic dental. The difference is that instead of a fan beam, it's a cone beam uh, that generates a 3D image, a uh, full 3D image, uh, of, of the patient's uh, uh, dental areas. Um, it is CBCT, it's uh, CT, and thereby in many areas it's regarded as a normal CT. So requirements for QA and for uh, regulatory uh, data and measurements are that of the, for a CT, a normal CT scanner uh, in the hospital. There are some question marks when it comes to dental, CB, uh, dental CBCT as to the, the relevance of that or the appropriateness of treating it as a CT. So we'll look at it uh, as, we, as we move along. Um, in a dental CBCT, to measure the CTDI weighted, which is often pre presented in the, uh, in the console, as a measurement to, to be tested and to be, to be tracked. Um, you need to mount a phantom, a CT phantom, place that in the, in the beam. Typically, it's a head phantom. 
um, and make an exposure. Yeah. Compare that CTDI weighted value uh, when we do that measurement to the value on the console. Uh, if, by the way, that's the, the way that it's, it's to be performed, well, uh, we have an ion chamber that, that deals with the, that and handles that issue. Uh, but there are a number of challenges when it comes to uh, performing a dental CBCT uh, measurement, a CTDI measurement in, in dental CBCT. One of them being finding a holder for the fountain to place it where it needs to be. That's just one of the, the issues that, uh, that you encounter when measuring uh, CTDI in a dental CBCT machine. So that's one issue. How to, how to place it? Is there a holder to get it there where it needs to be? Um, and that holder, is that, does that provide, does that uh, give us the possibility to have a reproducible result, a reproducible positioning of the phantom uh, when, when, uh, when we prepare to do, to do that test? So that's question number one. Uh, then we've got question number two, uh, which refers to the CTDI formality, the formality of measuring CTDI in, uh, in the CT environment. Uh, what we use is a CT phantom. It's a cylinder made of PMMA with, with drilled holes in it. Uh, and the hole pattern is what you see around here, one in the center hole and one in each of the directions of the compass. Um, and for a head phantom, it's typically 16 centimeters in diameter uh, of, of size. So that's, that's the size of it. Thickness is typically 150 millimeters, so 15 centimeters in thickness. That's a typical thickness of a CT phantom. All right. So using that, we then need to perform me uh, some measurements using the CT ion chamber of 100 millimeter active length. That's why it's called the CTDI 100. Uh, typically, it's it's that 100 is is forgotten because it's it's the standard uh, when we're when when it, when it's, it's measured. So it's uh, typically called only CTDI weighted. And the way it's done is that we take the one third value of the CTDI 100 value in the center hole. So we measure the CTDI, CTDI value in the center hole. Then we add two thirds of the average of the CTDI values in the peripheral holes, the P, the peripheral holes. So, um, and then we add that up and that gives us the CTDI weighted. And uh, so that means that we need to make five a minimum of two, depending on what what uh, procedure you you adhere to, um, but the, the standard international IEC standard calls for five measurements: one in the center hole and one in the, each of the peripheral holes. Um, so that's that's one way. That's that's the way CTDI uh, weighted is calculated and measured. Okay, so that's the little bit of background of the CTDI functionality. Now, challenges that arise when we put this in, uh, into a dental CBCT machine is that we may have a symmetrical, asymmetrical rotations. So this, the, the, that the, the gantry moves in, an, in a different way. Maybe the rotation is perfectly circular, but the position, the placement of the phantom is off-center. That means that we have an asymmetrical rotation. That's, that's one asymmetry that we may encounter. There's another one where we may have the, the cube uh, gantry moving in a non-circular fashion. Maybe it's oval like this, maybe it's pear-shaped, uh, but there are some that have a non-symmetrical and asymmetrical rotation. What, are, what does that mean? What does that mean for the CTDI measurement? Well, in, in this case, it may be for the, for the center hole value, maybe this evens out when we have a little bit of a, a difference. It's closer here, so we have a higher dose rate uh, for the center hole when the tube is in this position right here to the left. And that may even out where, where, when the tube is in this position, when the, 
where the distance is, is a little bit longer. So the dose rate is then, of course, a little bit less. So maybe this evens out. But what about the values in these holes right here? And what about the whole uh, the, the difference here in this hole? Due to the to the, the, the scattering effects inside the phantom, it doesn't even itself out uh, if for the for these holes right here, the, the peripheral holes. So you'll you'll have a difficult time to get a, a, a repeatable value or, or a correct CTDI value with this asymmetrical rotation like this. Similar phenomena is when when the asymmetry is in this fashion, where we have an oval or egg-shaped or pear-shaped uh, rotation, and the uh, the dose values, the dose rate values, and the dose values of, uh, of course, and also uh, will not be in compliance with the CTDI uh, formality. So that's a bit of a problem. Now. There's also gantries that rotate less than 360 degrees. Maybe it's only 270 degrees, even though it's perfectly symmetrical and sort of circular uh, motion. Uh, it may also be just 180 degrees, uh, depending on, on the machine type. So it's, it is a little bit uh, tricky to, to figure this out. But then again, we may say that, OK, it's not strictly the CTDI formality as it is defined in the IEC standard. Uh, the manufacturer has uh, their way of me measuring and, and uh, defining CTDI. So what we need to do is repeating that setup, the setup that the manufacturer has um, to when they're doing their CTDI estimations. So in, in, in that case, we could be we could be we could be fine. And that's okay. I mean that is that is quite true, but we may we will encounter some challenges in positioning the rotation of the phantom uh, in the right way, the same uh, orientation as a manufacturer has. If we don't, then we're, then we're off due to a, a setup uh, problem um, that we don't have the same setup as a manufacturer. The distance it's off uh, is also, of course, and uh, fixated because we have an, a, a zero point or a reference point in the gantry, so that's fine. But the orientation, the rotation of the phantom uh, plays a role, makes a difference when we're when we're measuring in, in an asymmetrical rotation. So that's uh, th those are our two issues, and when we when we get into to that. Uh, that problem. Um, all right. So I said the same thing here for the if it's less than 360 degree rotation. Well, then the, 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 the circular motion is incomplete. Also, here we need to figure out the, the, the exact positioning, the exact rotation that, that the manufacturer has uh, if we want to, to uh, compare it with the values in the gantry. So that's uh, a lot of, of adjustment to be done. Uh, we could say also that well, we don't really care if it matches the value in the in the in the console on the console. Uh, all we want to do is have that index value, the CTDI index value, uh, as a reference to see how it uh, that it that, that it stays constant when, over time, so that we don't have any changes in the CTDI value. And that's fine, and then maybe different differ from from what's on the console. But again, we need to figure out and make the position exactly the same way, uh, rotating the the um, phantom exactly the same way as we did the other time, where other times we performed that uh, that measurement, and which is might be might work. It might work. Uh, also, when you have different people. We we're measuring on the same kind of, of uh, gantry and same same kind of equipment. Uh, there are chances that they will be able to to perform this in, in, a, in a good way. So, uh, but of course, uh, there there are challenges with it. And the challenges that summarize it: it's not always a symmetrical motion. The the, the movement that the, the the that the gantry does around the phantom 
is not uh, or is not always symmetrical or circular, uh, which is a requirement when we're looking at the CPI weighted. And it's also positioning the the the, the phantom in in height is another uh, challenge as well, when where it needs to be uh, uh, well positioned in uh, in, the, in the gantry. Uh, we do have a challenge also then with when the rotation is less than 360 degrees or other than 360 degrees. Uh, it may be that it rotates more than a, a full uh, rotation, more than 360 degrees, and uh, then we need to, to look into that as well, of course. Uh, the beams are quite small here also, and that also plays trick, tricks and may, causes some, some challenges. Uh, when we're looking at the scatter in the in the phantom, uh, and especially the scatter that affects the peripheral holes, uh, if we're in the in the center hole and it's a perfectly symmetrical uh, rotation, that's fine. It doesn't we don't we don't need to worry too much about the the, the scattering effects. But with the smaller beam uh, in it, then then we have some 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 interesting scattering effects that uh, that we need to take into account. Um, and also the rotational dependence of the, the, the phantom, so that we have it, the, the holes, uh, the peripheral holes oriented the very same way as we did the last time, or that the, the, the same way as the manufacturers uh, provided, uh, did the measurement uh, when they, when they uh, calibrated the machine. So this is then for, for machines where you have the, the, the standard phantoms. There may also be then where you have manufacturers who work with their own phantoms. Uh, and then that's a, a very interesting story to, to take into account when you have other, other values which are not typically CTDI uh, or conform with the CTDI formality. And we've got some, some other challenges as well. All right, so also, of course, this is a time consuming setup to take into account the positioning of it, getting the holder in the right position, uh, rotating it the way it needs to be, and, and uh, working with uh, everything else. That uh, takes some time to get that right and to, to perform this, to perform that test. So uh, we may want to look at a different way of using and testing. Um, the constancy of the machine, uh, a, a, a procedure that is, that is quicker and more reproducible, and repeatable, so that we can have a, a relevant value uh, to compare with over time. And that may be one of the solutions, may be uh, the, the using the measurement of those area product of the DAP. And there's also uh, another term is also CAP, Herma area product, uh, which are the the similar principles. Um, and just a little bit of a, a recap then to figure out where we are. The definition then of, of DAP is that if we've got an area, uh, an X-ray beam of a certain uh, area, and we measure the dose in the beam, um, and then we look at the sides and determine the area of the beam uh, projected. So that's in this case, if it's a if it's a rectangular beam, it's A times B. That's the area. Uh, so the DAP is a dose area product, the dose, and then the area, and, and the, the product of those two. That's uh, multiplying them. That's D times A. So that's the dose area product. That. Um, the challenges here, of course, then are to if we want to perform this in a, in a smart way, is to identify the beam limits where are the how wide is the beam uh, when we're looking at it so that we can figure out the area of it we then measure the sides accurately that's uh, another challenge that we that we encounter so that we can figure out a, 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 an area of it uh, and of course the area is needs to be perpendicular to the beam, 
because it's the effective area that we need to figure out and get the dose out of uh, when we're when we're measuring it. So there are a number of challenges for that. But uh, saying that we do, we will then have a, 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 a what do you call it a, a unit or a measurement that is independent of distance. Because if we've got it looking at it in principle here at a distance of d, we have one area which is we call a. Uh, with the inverse square law, as we know, at twice the distance, uh, since it's a it's a spherical projection of it, we will then have four a of the of the projection of the of the beam. So. That means that we've got an area which is A, and the dose here is D at this uh, this uh, distance. So the DAP one is D times A. Twice the distance, the area is then, as we said, 4A due to the spherical uh, projection. Uh, so the dose two with index two is dose one divided by four due to the inverse square law. It's twice the distance, thereby it's going to be a fourth of the dose rate, or the dose in these areas. So the dose is going to be D divided by four, it's four. So that here in the second position is D divided by four times four A. So the dose is D divided by four, and the area is four times. So those things cancel out, even out, and we arrive at D a. So the DAP1, the DAP in this position, is the same DAP, same value, as we have down here. And that's uh, the beauty of having a, a, a measuring DAP, because it's then uh, distance independent, so to speak. So how can we put that into to good use in a smart way? Well, we could, of course, uh, look at uh, the beam, identify the edges of the beam and the CBCT, uh, figuring out the, the area of the beam. Typically, it's going to be a circular beam for, for a CBCT and a cone beam CT, so it's circular or uh, like a pyramid. So, but we need to figure out where are the edges of the beam and find the area of it, uh, and then measure those at that precise distance, and we've got or that, and that's fine. There, but taking into account the challenges that we saw before, uh, we may have some, some challenges uh, in, that, in that procedure. So looking at the DAP chamber instead, and, uh, where we have um, a parallel plane ion chamber, that's basically, basically what it is, it's an ion chamber in here, like any other uh, ion chamber. Um, it measures the incoming radiation, and the good thing about it is that it's angular independent. So we don't need to worry about the rotation of it either. Uh, the only thing we need to worry about is that the radiation, the extra, the beam, needs to fit inside the frame. Uh, that's that's the only restriction that we have of it. So if we're looking at the active area, which is what we see here, the, the translucent area, transparent area, if we've got a beam this size, it's well inside the beam, it's going to be okay. So that's a, that's a good uh, measurement. Same here, if we maintain the beam inside the, the DAP chamber, it's okay. We can, we can assume that we've got this, uh, size, we're very close to the to the source. We've got a small footprint of the beam. As we move away, we've got a larger footprint uh, uh, of it, since it diverges with distance, um, and thereby we have a larger field area of that DAP chamber exposed. The good, the, in, if it's the same uh, beam, same machine, same technique. We're going to get the same value for this exposure as we do with this exposure. Because this here is closer to the beam, the dose rate is going to be higher. Uh, as we move away, the dose rate will then 
deteriorate and we'll have a lower dose rate but a bigger beam bigger footprint of the beam uh, so and they will even out so we'll have the same that value here as we have here with the same beam so that's quite interesting all we need to worry about is like this we cannot allow the beam to move outside the, the active area of the DAP chamber and then of course we 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 lose track of it um, and what we uh, might be interesting here or confusing sometimes but the here is the area that we're cal calculating with so this is an 86 by 86 millimeter uh, ion chamber um, so this with a higher um, uh, dose rate uh, and then we've got another here with a lower dose rate but a, a larger projection is giving us the same the same values all right so how do we put that to use in dental applications then well in order to make sure that the beam fits inside the the dap chamber uh, the edges of the dap chamber why not stick it right onto the um, the tube output port then there we'll be able to catch all outputs the whole beam without having to worry about anything uh, gaping outside the, the edges of the, of the active area so using tape or, or uh, velcro straps or what, whatever we need to do this is a, a solution that we can that we can get it to um, um, capture all of the output uh, radiation from uh, from a dental CBCT. So here's one example, a larger, uh, small. Here is the smaller one again, and we looked at the 86 by 86 millimeter uh, areas. Uh, and then we've got here another um, interesting solution where they they put it into a plastic bag, which is fine. I mean that doesn't affect the the radiation at all. Um, and uh, that'll be fine. The only thing there is that we need to ensure that this captures the complete beam. So this may be a little bit uh, uh, risky to, to do it. So the best solution is, yep, just stick it onto the tube side where we have the uh, output port like this and uh, to capture all the data. So for the that is excellent for periodic maintenance checks, uh, also for QA and for yearly uh, inspections uh, in those areas where DAP is an approved way of doing it. Uh, so in some areas, of course, there you need to perform the CTDI and uh, that's and it has to be done until that, uh, that uh, regulation changes. Uh, in the meantime, you for for periodic checks, um, preventive maintenance, etc. Uh, using a DAP chamber is a really fast way of doing it. And in most uh, machines today, most uh, gantries, you have both the CTI weighted and DAP values uh, that you can compare with uh, to see that they match. Uh, and, uh, the, the the data matches. Uh, with with what's on the console, um, and using our uh, the RTI equipment, this is what it would look like when you're using Quick Check uh, and connecting uh, um, what do you call it a, a DAP chamber to your system, to your Cobia or to your Piranha, and make an exposure. This is what it would look like. So you have a cap, uh, both the, the the dose or the exposure. And also the exposure rate, the average then over the exposure, and the exposure time, of course, uh, as you move along. So this is the 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 DAP theme from uh, RTI. It's a Cobia dental or a Piranha dental using a chamber adapter to to provide the biased voltage uh, for the ion chamber, uh, and then of course the ion chamber, uh, either the smaller one, 86 by 86 or 147 by 147, which is a typical size for RF um, collimator rails that, uh, that, you can, that can be used. So the, that chamber connect, connected to a 
chamber adapter and an air chamber adapter connected to the Piranha or the Cobia uh, to get the DAT values. Um, all right, so that's, uh, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, the procedure is much quicker uh, when we're talking about uh, the setup, just tape it or strap it onto uh, the tube side, the output port, make an exposure and you're done. So that's, uh, I think, it, and it's for repeatability. Again, there is not very much thing that can go wrong. As long as you strap it and you have it on the, on the output port, the same technique as before, you'll be capturing the same uh, all output radiation uh, from the tube. So for reproducibility purposes or repeatability, uh, you're home free. It's, uh, it's a very simple setup and very, very easy to, to mimic. Uh, and also fast, of course. There's uh, a lot of time to be saved there, and which is what you need when you want to do uh, an efficient preventive maintenance procedure. All right, then there's some other setup challenges. Uh, one typical one is when we're looking at a C arm or a, or, or a, a vascular or other, other types of machines where we have um, uh, measurement points or positions that are not on the tabletop. So what you do is you typically you flip the, the C arm upside down. You've got the detector or image intensifier on, on, on the bottom. And that is where sometimes you find some strange positions where dose, a dose rate needs to be measured, either 20 centimeters or 30 centimeters or could be skin dose or max R doses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So sometimes these positions are uh, due to uh, uh, that you you want to have a phantom or something else to attenuate the beam uh, and uh, measure the skin dose on that. So it's you have a you place the detector on a phantom uh, slab, phantom slab. But sometimes it needs to be free in air for other reasons. And those reasons may be historical, right? Uh, the measurements usually or originally were made using an iron chamber, which is prone to backscatter. And to reduce the backscatter um, and only measure skin dose, then they had to move away from, from any, uh, any scattering surfaces by maybe 20 or 30 centimeters to get that done. So that may be another reason why there's a need need for that. And these kind of setups need a holder so they can position the probe in uh, wherever it needs to be. And that's, of course, being uh, having been in the business for some time, of course, we've got holders to, to find those positions, but they also need time to set up and get it proper and, and verify, et cetera. So, it's, so if it needs to be done, that's fine. We've got the, the, the uh, RTI can, can provide the tools needed for that. But there are other ways of doing this with, uh, if you give it some thought. And again, we can revert to the inverse square law, uh, which is when we, we look at the, the, break it down a bit, and we see the relationship with, between two doses is um, this. It has an inverse relationship to their relative distances to the source squared. So this is that's how it works. So if we know one dose in one position, we can then calculate the dose in another position. And we can use that phenomena and that technique to calculate uh, where we need to where we need to be. So we get at a, um, any point in a random point anywhere uh, from from uh, in the beam, we can calculate the dose at in that point by measuring it here with an instrument, maybe a piranha or something like that, uh, at a distance which we call source to detector distance, with the detector being the focal spot, and then source to skin distance, which is here. And using the inverse square law, of course, this will give us the intensity or the dose here, uh, I1, 
is the measured dose multiplied by two distances squared. The, um, uh, SDD squared divided by SSD squared. So this is this is the mass behind it. Uh, luckily enough, we've got that already uh, set up and ready to use in Ocean, in templates in Ocean, where we use the the, the phenomena or the the entity called exposure norm, which is normalized. So it's normalized to a defined distance, uh, and that is in calculated using the inverse square law, based on the dose at a measured point, uh, whereas it's measured by the instrument in, in the field. Uh, and those measurements, those distances, are SSD and SDD, the source to detector distance and the source to uh, skin distance. So that's that's how it's being how, how it's been used. And this is then what it looks like in in a formula. We've got SDD and could be inches or centimeters. That doesn't really matter. But we can input here from the keyboard the the values that we need. For instance, the source to detector the focal spot to the instrument is 52 inches, 52.5. We're going to look at the skin dose at 44 inches from the, the focal spot. So it's about eight inches or something like that uh, above the detector or the, the, the instrument. So that means that we're measuring exposure here. That's where the, the what the instrument is measuring, which is then 19.93 MR. But then we're looking at, we want to figure out what is the dose at a position which is closer to the, the focal spot and rightly so it's then increasing it's 28.11 at this the ssd distance from from the focal spot so this is then all done internally with the the, the ocean software it calculates it so all we need to input is the source to detector source to the instrument and the distance at which we would like to know the dose so we get the exposure measured by the instrument and then calculated, normalized to this distance. So that's uh, that's kind of an, a good way of doing it because uh, we're the the, the RTI instruments being solid state with backscatter protection, of course, are not affected by backscatter. So we can uh, we, you can place them directly onto a scattering surface. Uh, still measure uh, the skin dose or the skin entrance dose uh, or the karma directly in, uh, with uh, with the detector. Um, so then we don't need any any stands or holders or anything like that to perform the measurement. We can get that done in a fast way um, by just by compensating for the with the inverse square law knowing the distances. Right, then also from the field, we've, we've learned that mass measurements are sometimes interesting, not only the linearity of the mass and MA, the dose mass linearity, there's of course critical, but sometimes there is a need to measure mass directly, to get, a, get a reading of the mass directly, not only the linearity of and if we're looking at the, the, the traditional one or the original is to go into the, the generator, and then disconnect the jumper and connect your, and reroute the, the, the tube current through an invasive MA meter. And um, of course, for that you need access to, to the generator not everybody has access to uh, access to it and not everybody wants access to it uh, and uh, it also then requires some time to go in make the connection make the measurement and then reassemble everything again uh, and there is an element of risk not only to yourself but you may you're fiddling in uh, and working inside a generator with uh, with high 
voltage. And of course, that presents a risk of, of uh, breakage or damaging the generator, if not yourself. So, of course, if that needs to be done, then that's the, that's the, the more most precise way of measuring the, the MA or MAS. Uh, of course, we, we offer uh, naturally invasive MA meters as well, and mass one. But for our others who want to make a, a quicker judgment of it, there are non-invasive mass measurement uh, methods. Uh, one is the, the mass two, which is a clamp on, it clamps on to the high tension cable, preferably the cathode side, where we don't have any so much other signals to, to, uh, to work around, uh, but mainly the, the tube current. So clamp it on to the high tension cable. Uh, it uses the, the induction caused or the, the inductive magnetic field caused by the tube current uh, running through the cable. Uh, and if it's connected together with it and together with an instrument in the beam, uh, this is what it would look like. We've got all values from the instruments, KV, dose, time, everything like that, plus MA and MAS values from the clamp arm meter. So we've got the MA and the MAS. Uh, having that in, in the display software, of course, we also get all three signals, the KV, the dose in green, and then in blue, we've got the MA signal to, uh, to show what's, uh, what's um, um, show the, the MA movement and the, the lag movement. So it's a, a good way of, uh, of checking, of doing fault finding and troubleshooting. Um, also, uh, yeah, to, since, since it's, a, it's a very quick uh, solution to it. Um, and um, there are, of course, challenges. We're looking at a, a signal that it has to penetrate possible shielding around the high, high tension cable. So uh, there are limits to how low we can go in MA. Uh, the, 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 the lower the MA, the weaker the magnetic field, of course, and then the dip, more difficult it is to pick up a signal there for, for MA. Uh, so there are natural limits to it. But if, if you look at it here, you see you've got uh, five mass at 100 milliseconds. And we were looking at 48 milliamp, which is quite uh, quite interesting to, to, uh, to get that achievement. Um, all right, then we've got another way of doing it also. Sometimes the, the high tension cables are are um, locked in or they are, they are hidden behind panels or, or inaccessible for a clamp on. And also the, the generator is hidden so that uh, those breakout points are unavailable, they're difficult to get to. Then there may be solutions to find a controller board for the, for the, for the MA, where there are uh, test points. Uh, typically, there would be a signal of uh, 0 to 5, 0 to 12, or whatever uh, span it's going to be in the dynamic range. Uh, and that is then uh, proportional to an MA, a, a tube current. So there's a scale factor that, uh, that we need to take into account. Um, if that's the case, if that we have that available, we can attach um, the uh, MA test point cable, which is the instrument that we look, we're seeing right here, uh, where we have a cable here, we can attach these, we can attach uh, crocodile uh, clamps onto these, and then, then hook up to one of the test points and chassis ground and uh, get a reading uh, from that. Um, and the scale factors are then built in to, to this system. So it's programmed for those scale factors. So if we're reading three volt, Signal, we may know that it's uh, it corresponds to 62 MA and stuff like that, knowing the scale factors that we have and for that typical uh, machine. Um, so that, of course, is an indirect M M MAS or mass measurement as well, which doesn't require us to dig into the high tension side of, of things uh, and uh, gives us easier access 
to an MA signal, even though it's not the true MA, but it's a, it's a, a scale or a, or a mirror image of the scale of the MA signal. Um, and in many cases, this is also a procedure where uh, the, the same procedure and the same connection points used to connect oscilloscopes to perform an MA measurement in this way. Of course, that method is much more cumbersome. Here you get the MA and the, the mass values directly uh, in, in the display, whereas with the oscilloscope you need to do your maths and calculate the different parts of the of the, uh, the pulse of the waveform, um, but this is then also an, an indirect. So there are two indirect ways of, of uh, measuring. That's this one, which is the MA test point cable, and the clamp on uh, mass two uh, probe. So uh, there we go. There is what I had to, to share today with looking at alternative to CTDI weighted for, for dental CVCT. A very simple way of using a DAP chamber to have reproducible and repeatable method. And then also making use of the inverse square law to make positioning of a detector more more free. And finally, uh, two smart ways and two easy ways of, of measuring the MA and MAS indirectly. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, see if you have any questions. We do, Eric. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Uh, since we're coming up on our 60-minute mark, I'm going to jump right into the questions. The first one an attendee would like to ask, we use Excel to calculate the dose at a certain distance from the tube, correcting it using the inverse square law. Can we do that with RTI instruments? Uh, yes, oh, uh, of course. Well, it's it's uh, there are different ways of doing it, doing that. Um, uh, of course, you have the values, and you can just do the math and key it into to Excel. But there's also a way of of uh, exporting that data directly into an Excel spreadsheet and uh, so you, you you don't have to do the, the manual keyboard entry of the data so yeah there are there are several ways of doing that yeah perfect uh, and another attendee has asked where is DAP used for dental CBCT instead of CTDI uh, with there have been um, in Europe. It's it's being uh, used mainly because of the the, the repeatability and reproducibility issues, uh, and um, so and we we understand that it's being looked at in certain areas or in certain states in the U.S. as well as Canada. And so we're we're looking forward to to having a, a more easy way of, of doing it, a more reproducible and precise way of doing the, the PMs and, and the, the inspections yeah, in the not too distant future in many places. Good. Uh, let's see, scrolling through some of the questions. Here's one. What is the regu What if the regulations demand that the probe is placed at a certain distance free in air? How can that be solved? Well, uh, re yeah. yeah, regulations are regulations, and that's something that you can't really do much about in the short term. Uh, then you need to find uh, holders, and of course there are there, there are holders available for for all testing that needs to be done. Uh, so uh, then you need to revert to using a holder uh, for for those regulatory checks. Uh, but there are in, in many cases you do more than just regulatory checks and uh, for those preventive maintenance or the regular monthly tests or whatever that is done that can then be used uh, with uh, just uh, using the inverse square law in, in ocean templates uh, to save time 
and uh, to keep patients in the room in the x-ray rooms instead of, of the technicians Very good, Eric. Thank you so much for your time today. This was a great presentation. I'd like to encourage everyone that tuned in to certainly go visit RTI Group's website, learn more about this company and the products and services that they provide to our industry. You can learn more by going to rtigroup.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain the CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. That survey is going to arrive via email within one hour. Uh, you must complete the survey to receive the certificate, and you'll be able to download the certificate to your computer. If you have any questions, you can always reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. All right, Tech Nation community, we're going to be back next week and every Wednesday in the month of August with another great Webinar Wednesday. Do go to webinarwednesday.live to see the upcoming calendar. You can go ahead and register, so you'll be sure to get the email notifications as the presentations approach. We'll see you back next week. Make it a great day.